I want to talk to you about some of the stuff that I've done uh, in terms of teaching Haskell, uh, specifically teaching Haskell to a rather atypical audience, uh, typically around like 11 to 14 years old. So this is my talk on sort of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I'll start with what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is essentially putting together a tool that lets you develop uh, using uh, Haskell in a web browser. So the structure of that tool looks like this. I just run this web server. Uh, the web server lets you, um, serves a page where you can write Haskell in your web browser, um, click a run button, the Haskell source is transferred to the web server, compiled using GFC.js, so it's transpiled into JavaScript. The resulting JavaScript is sent back to the web browser, where it runs right here in the web browser, and you see the result. Um, the code that you compile is built against one of two libraries that let you get graphics easily onto the screen. So one of those libraries is called Code World API. This is a standard Haskell library. It's on Hackage. You can actually build it using either GHC or GHCJS. Um, so you can take your same code, compile it locally, in which case it will start a local web server to serve your JavaScript uh, program. Um, the other version, Cobra Base, is a simplified version of the Haskell prelude. So it's a base replacement with a custom prelude, and it simplifies Haskell to the point where I feel it's reasonable to teach it to students starting at the age of about 11. Uh, so that means actually no type classes. I've removed type classes entirely from the exports. Uh, it also means uh, no curry functions, mainly because curry functions lead to poor error messages when you forget a parameter. Um, so a lot of simplifications to the library and something that is the Haskell language, but is not necessarily the Haskell that we're used to. So both of those two options are available. Um, this is the API presented from the Haskell perspective. Uh, so basically what we have here, and you'll recognize this if you're familiar with Gloss, is a graphics library built around the idea of composable pictures. So we can build pictures using these primitive functions like circles, rectangles, polygons, to get a simple picture. We can then transform them using translation, rotation, uh, recoloring, other kinds of transformations. And then we can compose them together using this monoid operation, which I write with the ampersand. And this operation simply combines two pictures by overlaying one on top of the other. These pictures do have transparency. So picture is kind of a, a nice coherent type. You can think of it as be, being like a function from point to color. Um, and then we have a, a few simple operations and an API to combine those together. Using that API, my students build these pictures. So they build a bunch of things here, you know, and they actually experiment with a lot of the basic concepts of functional programming. So a lot of these examples give you things like uh, top-down decomposition, where they've divided their pictures into parts, and each of those parts have parts. Uh, so you know, they, they learn to, uh, to define abstractions, to work with those abstractions. They learn to use uh, list comprehensions and iteration to build patterns of various kinds. And they even get to experiment with recursion using fractals, which is, of course, the most fun thing there ever was to do with recursion. <laughs> uh, so we started giving them the ability to make these drawings. So they describe a picture. They put it on the screen. Uh, the second thing we give them is the ability to move those drawings around. And really simple API. You just describe a function from the current time in seconds since the program started to a picture. And then we put that on the screen. So really simple. And not only that, but it really kind of uh, gels with what they're learning from a mathematics standpoint. Because how do you make a projectile? Well, you need a quadratic function. How do you make something move back and forth? Well, let's talk about sine or cosine. So we get to, to talk about the functions and the kinds of expressions they're seeing in algebra and a lot of their math education and put those directly to use. The third step, which is where things get to get a little bit more complex, but still, I think, uh, exciting, is where they start to build state into their programs. So here we build a, a programs using an initial state, which is an arbitrary data type of their choice, uh, a function which advances the state in time. So given an amount of time between frames of the animation, how do we advance the state? Uh, function from state to picture. And then that 
describe as a program which runs. Using this, they build simulations of physics. They build little like model Rube Goldberg machines with chains of cause and effect and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. Uh, they learn how to do uh, modeling of data with types is a really important you know, point in understanding in their progression. And then we spring upon them that, hey, they can actually build whatever they want with just that plus a user interface event handler. So now we just add one more parameter here, which is given a user interface event, which could be a mouse press or key press. Um, how does that change the state? And using the same model, they build things like complicated games. Uh, this is a game built the very first year I taught this, wherein a fish is trying to avoid being eaten by a larger fish, um, eat smaller fish, and also avoid sushi because sushi is poisonous to fish. <laughs> um, and then actually, as of about a year and a half ago, they can also build multiplayer network games. And this type is really awesome because this says, you know, I can build a multiplayer network game and almost all of this is the same as the previous type we just looked at. Ignore the static PTR bits for a while. If you know things about like Cloud Haskell, that might make some sense to you. Ask me later if you actually care why those are there. But we still have just a number of players, and then we just have those same four uh, primitives. The only difference is being when you receive a UI event, you need to know which player number that came from. And when you're producing a picture, you need to know which player number you're producing that picture for. So they get to go all the way up into building network multiplayer games. These are some of the classes that I've taught. So here we have the first class I ever taught this in. That might not look like a school to you, but it actually is. This is my next door neighbor who uh, quit her job working as 30 years for as a middle school teacher and started a school in her living room, invited one class of students, and they came over every day and she taught them for the school year. So um, that was the first place I actually taught this. Uh, some of these other pictures, this is a school in San Bruno, this is a school in Mountain View. These are other places where I volunteered and been involved. Uh, here I was assisting, this is Brooklyn Cook, who's also been teaching this a lot. Uh, and other places I've been involved in, in teaching this. This is not the only places this platform's been used. So it's also been used in computer science classes at, let's see, Australian National University, University of Pennsylvania, a couple of other places as well. It's been used for about 300 high school students in Louisiana for a computational thinking class. So this platform actually is kind of catching on. Now, let's talk about why I built this. I built this actually not at all to teach computer programming, and I built it entirely to teach mathematics. And mathematics is really important to me, but it has a bit of a public relations problem at the school <laughs> level. And that public relations problem is this. We tell ch children they should learn reading, and there is a like, billion dollar industry of children's literature designed to make it fun and engaging to them. You know, we have Harry Potter and all these things. We tell them they should learn history, but we indoctrinate them from an early age that pirates are cool, and Vikings are cool, <laughs> and ninjas, right? and knights in shining armor. Uh, we tell them that they should learn you know, art. Well, art is just expressive and creative and fun. We should tell them they should learn science. And we support this by investing uh, disproportionate amounts of money in research into dinosaurs. Because why dinosaurs? I don't know if it's like that. So it's essentially a recruiting tool, right? Um, but we don't have anything like this for mathematics. You know, what is it that makes mathematics you know, fun and engaging and is what, why, you should, uh, why you should like it? And so my idea was, after trying a number of things, my, my fourth or fifth idea was that uh, maybe computer programming is that thing. Uh, so a couple of things about teaching mathematics. One is that we're learning that teaching mathematics requires the ability to get your hands on and manipulate things to try new things and figure out what happens. Uh, so these are called manipulatives in elementary school. We give students these physical objects that they can stack together and then notice, okay, if I put a row of three and a row of seven, then that's the same length as a row of 10. And so they learn things. Um, but then these phase out over time because we don't really know how to use manipulatives very well for teaching algebraic thinking. Uh, we also know that mathematical modeling is important. 
Um, so the new common core state standards for mathematics make a big deal out of this, that, it's, that mathematics is not just about learning the procedures, but learning how to model problems this way. Okay, so, and we also know that computer programming is, hey look, it's creative and expressive and collaborative and social, so we get all kinds of neat benefits there. It's experimental, it's concrete, it's manipulable, so we have these manipulatives. Um, it's scalable and project-based, so as opposed to the rest of school, where the longest you spend on something is 45 seconds before you raise your hand and say, teacher, I don't know how to do this one. Um, you know, you can work on the same project for you know, six, seven weeks. And it's fun and it's engaging, but we have one problem trying to teach mathematics with most programming, and that is these words, variable, function, equals signs, they mean something different for most programming languages than they do in mathematics. Uh, so variable in an imperative language means, oh, it's a box, you can change what's in it. As a side effect of, doing, of working out this number, I'll also change the number. Uh, function means a, a sequence of actions. Uh, you write things like x equals x plus one, which is of course never true. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you might say, well, okay, I'm being too picky. Does this really matter? And so I'll point you to uh, Marilyn Carlson and Michael Ortman, who wrote probably one of the most widely used Calculus One books in the world, and they did a bunch of research. They said, what predicts whether students will succeed at algebra, or, uh, sorry, at calculus or not? And the one key finding they found is that the best predictor of success in calculus is whether you are stuck in what they call an action view of a function. That is, whether you are stuck thinking of a function as a thing that performs a sequence of actions and then returns a response, or if you have a more flexible view of a function as capturing a relationship or a process between inputs and outputs. And so, in some sense, it was turning around and saying, so we're going to fix algebra by teaching you JavaScript. <laughs> Sounds uh, a little troublesome. <laughs> um, and syntax matters, too. So Haskell has the advantage of looking a lot like mathematics is really great and you know convenient because if I want to write f of x equals 2x minus 3, I write f of x equals 2x minus 3. I don't write define function f x open brace return 2x minus 3. <laughs> um, so and syntax matters a lot because I you know we don't have to say like oh here's the math and here's the computer programming. Oh here's how you say this in math, here's how you say this in computer programming. We get to say basically we're teaching you to write math and use it to program a computer. There's a little, a lot of customization I've done to support that, but that's essentially the end of my story, is that I'm using Haskell, I'm sometimes abusing Haskell, but uh, it's all in the effort of being able to say, hey, write, write down some algebra, okay, and then this is how you describe what you want uh, out of a computer program. And so that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Uh, you mentioned a quote that uh, uh, is about the success in calculus being relations yeah. of doing fun functions that do versus functions that map relations. Yeah. How, if they are not already imperative programmers, do they develop that intuition about functions? Because oh, yeah. So, so kids develop that intuition all the time. They come into, in, in elementary school, math is all about what do you do first, what do you do next, what do you do after that. And you know, we teach them, for example, when we teach them to analyze an expression like 3x minus 5, we say, well, order of operations, which operation do you do first? And you know, all of these words are words that hint to them that what we really mean is you know, do this operation, then take that result and do this operation to it. Um, in fact, this is something that uh, challenges students in mathematics when they learn about things like the distributive property because it's breaking this rule that you always have to do the multiplication first. Hey, maybe you can factor the multiplication out, do the addition over there. Like, wait, wait a second, you know, you told me to do multiplication first. So uh, we use imperative language all the time, um, even in math teaching. Yeah. Uh, your functions, even in your initial, like early on, they map from like numbers to like states or pictures and things. And I feel like in math, they oftentimes teach functions and it's like numbers to numbers. Like, yes. Is that a confusing point? I didn't know. That. It's definitely a point that has to be taught. That, yeah. you know, the, the domains and ranges of functions are not always sets of numbers. They could be sets of pictures, they could be sets of 
you know, colors, things like that. So it's definitely a point that needs to be taught. Uh, yeah, you're right. Until you get into the university level, functions are always from the reals to the reals or something like that, right? Or some subset of the reals. All the reals except zero. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's an advantage to teaching that and also to teach people about the applicability of maths? I know like growing up, I had friends who, you know, they finished maths at yeah. high school or whatever and didn't go on. And, and you know, as adults, there's then perhaps a view of like, well, maths is just for numbers. And yes. then if, if a problem doesn't involve numbers, well, then maths doesn't help. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, th I think so. I, th I think one of the important points is uh, that math teaches people formal thinking, mm -hmm. right? And it's pretty much the only place that we kind of really completely formalize everything, and then we explore the power of thinking in a, in a completely formalized way. And this definitely, you know, answers that question pretty clearly in terms of like, when will I ever need this? It's like, well, you know, you're making your video game, you need it or not. I mean, I'm teaching it to you because this is what you need to know to figure out how to make the alien shoot back at something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so what sort of questions do your students ask you that you might not expect from, say, someone who's already graduated college and, and is trying to learn Haskell? Oh, um, so I don't teach too many people who graduated from college. My students tend to be middle schoolers. Yeah, so, so what sort of oh, questions? Oh, uh, yeah, what, what different questions do they ask? Um, whew, that's a good question. <laughs> No, nothing comes to mind, to be honest. I mean, uh, they struggle a lot more with spelling, with syntax. Um, you see a lot more, you know, a lot more students who like really just don't, are, are incapable of seeing that they have typed a parenthesis somewhere because somehow like it just isn't registering in their mind. And so you're saying, hey, count the number of open and closed parentheses. There's more open parentheses. And they'll count it and somehow come up with the same number because that they just don't see what they don't expect to see. So I think there's a lot of interesting differences in terms of, you know, yes, the brain does develop over time and we build precision and we build skills like, you know, you know well, precision in particular uh, over time. Maybe that's an answer. Yeah. Well, that, that point in particular is what you're searching for. The fact that you have developed that intuition and I have had coworkers that have the same problem. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think a language like Elm could be a better fit if uh, it has like so yeah. maybe more native to the web and has better error messages or text files? Good question. So I, I think Elm out of the box would be a better fit. But it turns out that, that GAC is so customizable that what I was able to do with GAC is just um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so when I teach my middle school classes, I don't teach them the Haskell variant of this. I teach them my simplified prelude. And I told you it's a, a custom prelude, but it's also using the rebindable syntax extension. Um, I actually patch GAC so that you can define program equals instead of main equals for the entry point. Um, so I've done a whole bunch of stuff and I've done it deliberately in some cases to kind of preempt and replace some of the incorrect thinking that I see in my classes. And you know, those are just things that I don't think I'd be able to do in Elm because GHC is just an amazing platform for doing all kinds of customization and, and language tweaking. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, to that, to the, to that end, um, yeah. you've, uh, you said that you removed um, curry functions. Yes. But all of your examples were curry. Yeah, so the, the, examples <laughs> I gave you, the examples I gave you were from the, plan, the Code World API library, which is the standard Haskell library. It's used in, at, at the university level. Uh, so if you just imagine more parentheses and commas, then you'll see the, the library that I Yes. So it sounds like your talk, but this is probably pretty successful. Um, what are your next plans? Yeah, my next plans are I'm trying to put together some more reusable curriculum. Uh, that's that's probably priority number one for me, but it's, it's turned out to be a really hard task. I've tried a lot of approaches to this for about three or four years now, and I'm learning a lot about what doesn't work. And I think I'm getting a little closer to what does work, but uh, you know, ask me in 20 years and maybe I'll have finished. <laughs> are, you, are you looking for collaborators? I am definitely looking for collaborators, sure. Anyone who wants to help out, please come talk to me, uh, either on the programming side for like site features. You know, Crystal in the back of the room is gonna be working on this all summer as part of the Google Summer of Code program, so awesome. And so we're looking for like debugging tools. We're looking for anything else that can help sort of 
with the platform itself, there's a whole issue tracker of 160 suggestions. Um, and, and then I'm also looking for anyone who's got like ideas about what could be useful to help someone pick this up and bring it into a school. I've tried, I've, I've tried all kinds of things, making videos, making pre-prepared presentation slides, making written lesson plans, and I'm still kind of looking for the right magic combination. <laughs> yeah. Have you looked into internal graphics and what the skin community has done in terms of educating kids because they are, have done a lot of that? Yeah, I've looked into a lot of other platforms. So, uh, turtle, you know, lo logo and internal graphics yes. definitely was, you know, the first one we'll see more Pabbert. Um, I think one that I'm really excited about right now is Emmanuel Shanzer and some collaborators of his have a program called uh, Bootstrap, which is based on Scheme. And they're doing some, something very similar to this where they're specifically focusing on the similar between purely functional programming and algebraic reasoning. Uh, I do feel like they, they are not ambitious enough in terms of they want to run like a, a few week long program and hope to get a few objectives like understanding the use of the Pythagorean theorem, but they're not leaving a lot of room for program design, uh, for expressing creativity at the design and organizational level. And they're using Scheme, so. <laughs> <laughs> that would help you sidestep this issue of uh, partial evaluation and early functions. Uh, it, it would, but I, I've solved this issue now. <laughs> I just, oh, partial evaluation, uh, I actually like. So uh, in, in my customized library, when you construct an initial state, for example, I pass you an infinite list of random numbers that you can use to construct your initial state from. And I like that. that that's the way I would model things if I were reasoning from a math standpoint. I wouldn't say you have a random number generator. I would say you have an infinite list of random numbers that you that you can use. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. Do you have uh, do you have students that have gone on to use the uh, whole Haskell language and become uh, maybe professionals? Uh, the first students I've taught are just now going into university. So. It's, I wouldn't say that I've had any that gone up, go on to become professional programmers. Um, I also, again, I'm not really interested in educating people to be professional computer programmers. Um, you know, I have one student who was the best student the first year I taught this. She's gone on to become an artist and holds all kinds of art galleries all the time, and I'm happy for her as well, you know. And she loved this program because it let her do a different kind of art. And do you have any video of any of the animations you're seeing? Oh yeah, I can show you some stuff, but I think we're running short on time. So ask me later, and I'll be happy to show you things. Okay.